Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully you've um, checked on the introductory course intro video um, so you know what's going on or you've seen your email. If you don't, um, I'm your professor, Mark Crowley for EC404 Algorithm Design Analysis. And um, I've got COVID. So uh, the first couple um, topics um, in this first lecture, we're gonna do virtually. And then hopefully I'll be able to join you by Friday <clears throat> when uh, I'm feeling better and I'm less infectious. Um, <clears throat> so we introduced the kind of the topics and the overview in this first lecture, which is talking about um, some of the motivation and um, fundamental, I guess, foundations uh, for uh, algorithms and, and why we're doing this. So in the um, textbook, um, chapter zero, this prologue where they kind of give a nice little kind of story about where things come from and what's important. So this book's bit written in 2008, but I think they're still pretty much on task. I just read a blog post the other day about someone trying to argue that in terms of history. So, um, they were talking about, <clears throat> what was this guy talking about? Um, in, in the book, uh, this isn't super important, but it gives you an interesting thing. So he's saying, uh, that's Gupta and the authors of this book were like, oh, ideas that change the world. Um, and, um, you don't think about it, but uh, some of these things that we, we rely on um, for everything these days weren't always available in every part of the world. And, and when we mean the world here by their thing, they mean the European Western world. So that would be updated a bit. Uh, if it was written today, because that's always got its own bias. <clears throat> but you talked about two things, um, Gutenberg printing, um, these big ideas that kind of moved forward and essentially created the world we're in now, which, you know, uh, started sometime in the 14 or 1500s where they discovered North, um, the Western Hemisphere, they industrialized and mechanized a lot of things, they invented science um and we kind of entered the modern age as an entire world although obviously everyone did at different stages um and willingly or unwillingly um but he mentioned this printing books because then knowledge could be spread um and then basically um decimal system which is a very specific um point um but you know uh pretty important because before that they, they used, you know, Roman numerals and other systems, um, at least in the West, which are very hard to do any kind of large scale accounting with, right? And so this definitely was a thing that after the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages in, in Europe, information and knowledge that had been kind of saved in, in India and Middle East and other areas um, <clears throat> made its way to Europe. And then they actually started doing things more reasonably, like they didn't have the number zero in Europe until sometime like 14 or 1500s and they couldn't use these digits. Um, why our um, interest here, basically the whole reason they're mentioning this, um, and I will spell it wrong and obviously I don't know how to say it properly, but someone can inform me later. Um, Al-Khwarizmi from um, what is now Iraq, uh, had books that wrote up and described a lot of these either ancient Greek knowledge or Indian knowledge or Chinese knowledge um, about how to do arithmetic, basically. Um, and um, these kind of ended up eventually being called because they were mechanical um, processes um, that you could do, logical. Um, sorry, I have to get into writing on my tablet here. Um, logical steps um, to add, multiply, um, do other operations. Um, and these became known as algorithms. Um, and that's like a mispronunciation essentially of al Khwarizmi's name. Algorithm comes from these, um, <clears throat> these patterns and, and, and um, logical steps or recipes that um, he had described and that kind of took over in mathematical circles at that time. And so this idea we have of algorithm 
the word um, comes from that kind of origin. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, as we're saying, an algorithm is anything where, you know, we have a series of, of steps that we um, want to solve a problem, right? Um, <clears throat> which you know, but um, it's not the same as code, right? Right? Um, code is not the same as um, algorithm necessarily, because code has, um, you know, um, language specific um, details. It might worry about memory or not. Um, it <clears throat> has particular ways of being written, right? Um, an algorithm is sort of more universal, right? It's something that is the syntax is not important, right? <clears throat> In a sense, um, what, is, what matters is um, the logical relationships, right? Um, in, in the code that we're looking at, and even it has a mathematical tense, essentially any algorithm is usually described, can be described mathematically as a kind of a function um, that does things, um, although it's probably too specific. Um, and so uh, that's the way we'll be looking at things in, in this course. Um, so the first one we're going to look at um, is the Fibonacci sequence, um, because it's, we always start there, it's like the hello world of algorithmic theory. Um, <clears throat> and so continuing their story, Leonardo Fibonacci in the 15th century actually helped, you know, popularize and understand and translate al khwarizmi's work. And so some of the first algorithms from the European point of view came via Fibonacci. Um, and many of the things that, yeah, they have European names on them probably had already been invented or described somewhere centuries earlier by other names, but that's how it's named now for us. Um, so for Fibonacci, then I'll switch to my other notes. <clears throat> and so most of our notes for the course are going to be um, in this form. We've got these um, <clears throat> typed up structures which match kind of the main topics that we see in the book, in the textbook. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> Screen a bit. There we go. Um, what we'll do, and I'll do this in class as well, um, when we're back in class in person, is have these up. These these slots, <coughs> sorry, are already on on learn um, from the first four lectures, but with the blank spaces, um, and so we'll fill those in. Now, if you read through the text, you could probably fill them in yourself. Um, you can see something to follow along with while we're talking. You can write notes, especially if you can print it out or put it on your tablet or something. Um, it's just one way to do this. <clears throat> so the thing Fibonacci, other than popularizing algorithms um, at the beginning, from, from Europe's point of view, um, <clears throat> is famous for is this Fibonacci sequence. So he's got his own numbered, his own sequence of numbers, right? That's like a dream of any math person to have a sequence of numbers named after you or a proof, I guess. Um, but, you know, probably most sequences that are interesting have been um, rounded up, and if you're not mathematically leaning, you'd be like, why would you want a sequence of numbers named after you? Some sequences um, are important and, and show up a lot. <clears throat> so Fibonacci sequence shows up a lot um, in nature. Um, if you think of, like, there's these videos. If you look at Fibonacci sequence on YouTube, of videos of, like, seashells and stuff, They'll have these pictures of like the spirals of a of a nice seashell. This is my seashell picture. Pretty good, right? Um, where it fu funnels in on itself, right? And so <clears throat> you get these spirals. Uh, so Fibonacci sequence is something. Um, it's just a, essentially defining a set of numbers where every number in it um, is defined by <clears throat> some of its some combination of its predecessors, right? So the simplest sequence. You know, of numbers, obviously, it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, I can't even write that properly, right? 
and this sequence would be defined if we want to have some um, notation for it. I guess I'll just call it Sn, like for the sequence. Um, it would be that we're going to write a recursive definition that the the nth element of this sequence is just the n minus one-th element plus one, right? Um, if n is greater than or equal to zero, no, one. So we're going to say the positive sequence, we could even call them the integers, um, not the integers. If you're in class, you could correct me. The natural numbers. Um, <clears throat> So if n is greater than or equal to 1, um, then uh, we define this set to be um, <clears throat> all of the elements that are uh, defined by that, right? So um, <clears throat> you're just using the previous value to define the current value, right? So we're going to use this recursive kind of notation of its functions. Um, <clears throat> So for Fibonacci sequence, uh, we would define it this way. And the idea is that every one of these elements <clears throat> is the sum of the previous two, right? So one is the sum of zero and one, two is the sum of one and one, three is the sum of one and two, five is the sum of one and three, um, right? So we're saying that an element of this sequence is the previous two elements, um, add it together. So obviously this only works for the third element and onwards, right? So if we're talking about n greater than 1, right, let's say n um, <clears throat> if we have this as a table um, <clears throat> this is your index Hopefully that matches up. Ugh. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we've got one. And then we have to have um, our base cases. So um, remember base cases? Remember recursion? Uh, I used to teach 150, uh, and we'd start, we'd do recursion halfway through or near the end. I remember. Not everyone loves recursion. So there'll be a bit of recursion in this course. And I love recursion, so I won't hear any complaints about it. Um, but uh, it isn't always the best thing to use, but it is often the simplest way to describe something. Um, so the rest of the definition is like this, where we say um, our base cases, um, and any recursive algorithm you need of a base case, because otherwise it'll go on forever, right? Remember in recursion, you've got a function where you refer to that function itself inside its definition, right? And so if you don't have any base case that says stop, just stop, um, it'll go on forever and you'll run out of memory. Um, so it will stop, but only because you run out of memory. Math never runs out of memory. That's the best thing about math. Um, and so it would literally just be an infinite sequence and it would be wrong. So um, usually you have to have some kind of base case and say, well, in this sequence, if n equals one, um, then we just return one, that's by definition. And then if n equals zero, then we just return zero. So the Fibonacci sequence is zero, one, and then apply the rule. Um, <clears throat> now he could have defined zero and one in these cases to be something different. He could have said, well, in this case, it should be zero as well. And he didn't, right? That's why he defined it this way. Um, I'm not sure if it's that important. It probably has some very major theoretical implication. But in a sense, um, I don't know what the justification would be. <clears throat> Because this one's still the sum of the previous two, and the previous one is one, is zero, sorry. So why does this one have to be one? It is arbitrary in this case. That's just the definition, right? So this is given. But now we've defined this, and now, but these numbers actually come up in reality. It's a useful thing to be able to compute. Um, but it goes up a bit, right? So each, each number here depends on the previous two. So it actually increases very quickly um, in terms of the, the size of it, right? So, you know, so natural numbers, if you say, well, what's the, how big is the nth element? It's kind of just multiplied by how, how the index itself. But um, in Fibonacci, the sequence actually grows um, much faster. <clears throat> um, so here's a, a code version of this. 
um, and the reason it's kind of interesting and tricky is because it is actually hard to compute directly, right? If we just try to use that formula, here's the naive version, right? So this is kind of the, the naive um, algorithm <clears throat> where we just say, okay, let's take that formula and turn it into code, right? So we've got our pseudocode here. Um, we'll often be doing pseudocode of this kind. It's not any particular language, but we'll just use generic um, terms. Um, <clears throat> and so we got our base cases defined. And so if, it's, if the input n we give it is that, we'd, um, we'd get that number. And so this function really just, you tell it, you know, the index, right? So give me the 10th Fibonacci number and it will give you that number, right? So if you say Fib 1, uh, 5, it should give you 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It should give you 5. If you give it Fib and Fib 1, 6, it should give you 8, right? Um, that's all this function does. And there we just compute it. And the way we compute it is recursively. So we say that, you know, we're just calling the same function and call ourselves, right? So each one of these is going to create its own um, element onto the, the call stack if we have whatever language we're using. Um, they'll both get added, and then they will implement the entire thing again for a different um, lower number. The numbers are lower, so you could run this, right? So how long would this take? Is this an efficient algorithm? So anytime we're talking about all the algorithms in this course, um, we're going to ask a bunch of questions, right? Is the algorithm correct? Um, is it, um, what is its, how good is its runtime? So in the textbook, they talk, say, how much time does it take as a function of n? Another way to say that is, um, how efficient is it? So I'll talk about this a bit in, in lecture 1.5. I'm going to talk about Rubik's cubes um, to give an example of algorithms that can be efficient in different ways. Um, in this course, in this textbook, they're usually focusing on time, and that's usually what we want. Um, but you actually could ask that in terms of space as well. So how much memory it takes up. Um, and then how could we improve its complexity? But these three questions essentially um, are uh, always going to be asked. And the second one is the kind of the most um, kind of involved that we'll spend most of the time on. But they're all there. Um, <clears throat> So um, this is hard in this case because if we talk about the size of it, um, we just be computing how big the numbers are. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> question then is how can we um, analyze concretely what the um, <clears throat> efficiency is of an algorithm like this? So what we're going to do is define these um, recurrence relations. Um, so it's similar to the the functional form we defined before, but now we're going to make it more explicit and talk about the time that something takes. So we're going to find um, these recurrences, um, recurrences or um, recurrence relations, I'll call them. I mean the same thing for all of those. Um, it basically, it's um, just another form of that equation where the thing we're counting now is not just like the answer, um, but the amount of time it took to compute that answer, right? Um, so uh, what am I supposed to write here? We'd say that <coughs> <coughs> recurrence, 
we're defining Tn. Tn is the amount of time it takes to compute the answer for, for Fib um, 1n, right? Um, time taken to uh, compute Fib 1n. And what's time mean, right? Um, in um, computing steps. And what does a step mean? Obviously, it's a rabbit hole. So we can keep going down and down. We will get further into detail about those things. But say we have some kind of uh, definition of the smallest computational step that makes sense, right? Um, so for um, if Tn uh, <clears throat> is just uh, for It's going to be at least one step. So on our base case, we can do this as well. So when the n is uh, less than or equal to one, right? We know that for zero and one entries, we're going to get it's going to take us at least one step because we got to look up a number and return it. Let's just say it's constant time. So we're always going to be doing things in kind of a bound um, and say, well, it's one or maybe more than one. Um, but then for the recurs recursive case, we're going to define the same formula we had before, but now put in um, <clears throat> the number of steps using these uh, our recurrence and add it that way. Um, so we could say then there's at least um, two steps there at that first step, um, or three in the book. Why did they say three? Oh, the addition, sure. So say three. So in our, in our original code, if we look back at our code, right, we had like an if statement, um, a sum, um, I guess it's two if statements, we have if and if and the sum, right? So say oh, each of these is one computational step, just in a very high level. We're often going to be removing a lot of details like that and say, well, let's say these take about the same amount of time. Addition actually takes more time, so we'll get into that. Um, let's say this took three steps just to run one instance of it, and then you have to run the subset of those algorithms, and that will take whatever time it takes. So our mathematical definition of this could also be recursive, and we're saying, okay, here's the uh, a representation of how much time it would take, to, um, to compute uh, the number for any given number, right? Um, so the problem with this is that every time we do this, um, we will say, well, okay, really, if I gave it to you for <clears throat> t of eight, um, you know, it's gonna be, how much time did it take you to compute seven and how much time did it take you to compute six plus three? And that's really how much time did it take you to compute six, and how much time it take you to compute five, that's that first recurrence, and how much time to compute um, <clears throat> five, plus how much time did it take you to compute four, that's your second recurrence, plus three. Oh, and each of these has a plus three as well. Um, right, and so we're gonna keep expanding these out, so at the end there's gonna be, basically, each of these will have all of the numbers expanded out. And so there'll be as many terms as there are numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so we can get a sense of like what the scale is, is that this, the time to compute is gonna take slightly longer than, um, or maybe quite a bit longer than the size of the number itself. Um, it gives us a sense of how big this is. Um, the problem with Fibonacci is that it's very large um, <clears throat> numbers as well. So uh, when you work out what, um, what they say the runtime of this is proportional to actually the final runtime um, of it is um, <clears throat> proportional to uh, slightly more than um, The number itself All right. 
yeah, the proportional is, um, sorry, the, the runtime to get one particular number of it, um, which is similar to the, the size of um, the Fibonacci number itself, is 2 to the 0.694n, which we'll kind of get to later how to, how to compute that. <clears throat> and the main thing here is that it's exponential in, um, in n. So in, when we um, <clears throat> have the, uh, when people say something is increasing exponentially um, in the news, we usually mean like, oh, it's going fast. Um, it's increasing quickly. So crime's increasing exponentially or um, <clears throat> something is increasing exponentially. And it's usually not exponential, it's usually like, oh, it's doubling, or it's squared, or something. Um, but this is exponential, so like, in the exponent is the n. Um, and so we can compute five and six and seven, but Fibonacci 100 is um, 2.5 times 10 to the 20, right? So 20 zeros, it's a very, very large number. And if your time, your runtime is gonna be higher than that, um, because every one of these branches is gonna have as many terms as there are the Fibonacci number, that means your, your runtime is going to be um, incredibly huge. Um, and so a result they have in the, the book is that um, even if you can compute um, some answer, so the Fibonacci number of Fn plus 1, um, the time to compute, um, I guess we'd say it, the time to compute Fn plus 1 is uh, 1. 1.6 times the, the time it would take to compute um, the previous number um, to compute n. <clears throat> I think it, they mean this. Uh, right, so even if you can compute t Fibonacci 100, Fibonacci 101 would take you, you know, another 50% longer, right? So whatever your highest number is going to be, it's going to keep increasing um, quite a lot. And so um, <clears throat> the computing, uh, your computer getting faster isn't really going to help that much. Um, so it's a very inefficient algorithm, basically. Um, <clears throat> and um, so one reason it's bad is because there's a lot of repetition. So if we uh, look at um, how we're computing it, and you probably noticed this when I was writing the formula, you would have called it out if I was there in person, where it's like, oh, okay, we're computing this. We can now use a tree and say, well, what's each of the branch of the recursive tree, right? Um, and so to compute the fn minus one, we have to compute the previous two. We compute fn minus two, we compute the previous two, and we're already um, duplicating things, right? Um, <clears throat> Right, so there's a lot of um, unnecessary duplication of of things that um, <clears throat> that have already been computed, right? Because literally, um, each one of these these elements is um, a number, right? This is actually um, just just a number. After it's done, after it's been computed and everything's been resolved, this all gets wrapped up into just a number that we could store, right? Um, and yet over here, we're computing fn minus three again, and over here again, right? Um, oh, that, that didn't work. Um, <clears throat> right, so um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of inefficiency in the way that it's uh, computed and duplication. And basically it's an exponential amount of inefficiency because every time you go down the tree, you're gonna have all these branches and they'd be recomputing things over and over again. So, so a better way um, to do this um, <clears throat> is to have a more efficient algorithm, which doesn't duplicate, it just computes things as needed. Um, so uh, we'll just try to compute things just once. Right, and so this um, more efficient algorithm, we'll call it Fib2, does that. We still have our base case, so if it kills zero, we return zero. But we set things up so that um, when it now computes for element one, it'll give us the right answer. 
we initialize the, um, our storage and what we're going to store them for all the values, right? Um, so later on, we'll end up talking about things called um, <clears throat> dynamic programming, which you may have encountered already. Um, this is like a very simple version of dynamic programming here, where all it means is you save your work, um, basically. Um, don't redo something you've already computed, right? Uh, and so uh, that wouldn't necessarily always be possible depending on the domain, but in this domain it is, right? So we have um, our formula that defines the Fibonacci relation and um, we're just gonna use the previous value. So we set up the initial value so that when we do the first element, so we start our array at two now, we put our base case of zero and one in the definition for this array. Those are values and we start at two. So the third element, and we define it based on the previous ones. And we know those are safe because they're there. Um, and then we can just go through this loop once, right? So rather than going through a tree that has, you know, how many branches, um, and every one of those branches from root to um, to uh, to leaf has n steps in it. This will be a thing we'll talk about as well in this course: graphs and trees, different ways to represent an algorithm. If you think about how many steps it is to go here, that's n, right? And every one of them has n, right? So there's many branches. And all of them are n from root to um, to leaf, right? Um, obviously, there's some repetition here, but if you're going through every single branch of these from the top down every time, then it's going to be n times n um, number of steps, right? The worst you could do. Um, and so we'll call this our n squared, which we're going to introduce in the next short lecture. Um, but here we're saying this n steps because we're going through the loop once, and you know maybe. Maybe it's n plus one, right? Um, or three or something, because you gotta look up the values from the previous ones. How long does that take? Addition takes a certain amount of time, but it's constant, right? The important thing is that um, the calculation per loop is constant. It's not dependent on the size of n. And then we do it n times, and so it's n times some constant. And so we can say now this complexity is somehow at least um, the complexity of this thing will be linear. Right, and we'll define kind of different types of complexity of linear, polynomial, exponential, logarithmic, based on how many steps you go through, how much each step costs you, and how many steps you go through. Um, these are the two simplest ones to understand, which is like searching every leaf in a tree gives you n squared, so it's um, the complexity of this one is polynomial, we'll call it. Um, we'll go through these again. This is kind of giving you the taste of it. Um, and these ones are linear, right? Um, <clears throat> so we know the algorithm's correct, so hopefully, if you believe that, right? Because this is already um, filled in for those first two elements. And um, every next element will have the previous values already there. So you could do an inductive proof that shows that basically every one of these um, every time it computes this, it will be the correct one according to the formula. Like an inductive proof on this code would essentially be turning this code into words and using the original math um, formula. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then <clears throat> if we look at running it, so we ran this. Um, and uh, what do we have? We can tell that in terms of runtime, it should only take that time. So when we run it, um, oh, well, that's just saving operations. Um, <clears throat> that's what we're basically saying. It takes about 100 operations to compute F100 because you'll have to go through this. Now it might be, you know, plus or minus some constant, <clears throat> which we're not usually going to be worrying about as much. Um, <clears throat> and another reason is because, um, let me see if my next slide has that. Right, um, right, because, so that's what I would say, I guess, that this, this algorithm is more efficient because on a high level, um, it's linear in the number of uh, operations. But we still could ask that, right? How long um, does it take to add two numbers? 
um, and what's the efficiency of this? It depends on, it gets complex to talk about the actual runtime in seconds, right? Or even in flops, you know, or compute steps, because it depends on, you know, what's the um, data structure that you're using for this, right? Is this an array? Is this a linked list? Is this a hash table or hash map? Each of those answers would give you a different time it takes to access this element, right? If you're using a linked list that is only accessible in series, um, this would still be slow. Each of these would take you n steps to get to it, but you probably are using an array or something. <coughs> so these are essentially some constant amount of time. Adding is actually not that simple. In the worst case, an adding takes n steps to, to merge them all together, um, <coughs> right? Um, so addition of, of like two large numbers um, <coughs> could take um, about n steps. Right, the idea is if the numbers are both size n, um, it might take about n steps. And there's more efficient ways to do it in some parts, but you can't get around the fact that you have to examine all of them. And so we'd say they're order n. Um, but that's one of those things that addition, maybe you want to count it a bit higher. Multiplication also is expensive. Um, something like order n. Um, but um, other things like um, lookup um, is highly depending um, on the data structure and other things. So um, that's why when we talk about these things, we'll usually um, talk about um, higher level uh, complexity, which um, removes a lot of these details. Uh, and that's what the next uh, lecture we'll talk into when we talk about um, runtime complexity and big O notation. So I'll just stop here for this one.